Aloha friends, it's Robert Stelic. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Planet Show, which I produce right here in my home office in the garage. In today's interview, I speak with Adrian Roper, the man behind Axis Foils. We get into some tips for beginners, and then we talk in detail about foil design, how to set up the foil properly, how different things affect different um, things on the foil, new designs he's working on, uh, the mass, importance of stiffness, the fuselage, the angles of the foil, so many cool de technical things. I learned a lot from this show. I hope you do as well. I wanted to apologize in advance. The autofocus on my camera keeps going in and out of focus and it's very frustrating for me, but I didn't want to stop the flow of the interview. So uh, I hope you can just overlook that and focus on the technical details in the interview. You can watch this interview right here on YouTube or you can listen to it on your favorite podcast app. So I hope you enjoy this show. As always, please give it a thumbs up if you like it. Subscribe to the Blue Planet Surf YouTube channel. And without further ado, here is Adrian. Okay, Adrian Roper, welcome to the Blue Planet Show. Thanks so much for joining me. How are you doing today? Good, thanks. Yeah, beautiful sunny day and it's pretty glassy out there. So it might be a good day to go fishing. Nice. And you're, for you, it's like the middle of winter right now. Like for us, it's summer, but you've, you're kind of on the other side. It's so pretty, it's, pretty is much it pretty winter. cold or how, how cold? Uh, is it? It's cold, like compared to Hawaii, it's cold. But I mean, I still went foiling yesterday and had quite a good session. Um, Excellent. I, I, didn't, I didn't have a full on thick suit on either. So it's not too bad. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so this, this season, I'm trying to start a little bit with uh, beginner tips right away in the beginning. Last last year, I always kind of um, did that as, as an afterthought at the very end, but I want to kind of start with some good tips for people that are new to wing foiling. Yep. And then we're going to talk a little bit about your background and and uh, and get more into uh, the equipment side of things and, and technique and so on. So let's start with that. Um, what are some tips you have for people that are new to uh, wing foiling? Seem look, we have quite a few learners around us, and I, I guess one of the, the biggest things is when you're learning, you don't know how to pump properly, and and getting up on the foil is the biggest deal. Just getting up and going. So having um, a little bit bigger hydrofoil than you might normally think, you know, is a good idea because it helps you get up, and also having a slightly bigger wing. As you improve with your skills, you don't need quite so much. Having an easy riding foil makes a difference, and like with the Axis stuff, um, the BSC range that we came out with, the bigger ones, the 1060 and the 970, they were particularly good and they are particularly good for people to learn on. And then we've also introduced the recently the SES, which is like a, a complete package. And that comes in 1040 and 940. And it's, it's um, basic and simple, um, but it works really, really well. And it's a great entry into the whole access platform you can you know um upgrade it as as you want bits and pieces wise um but it, they're both the bsc range and the ses are particularly good for learners you can stand in slightly the wrong place you know you get away with a murder with them and they just they still ride along quite nicely easy easy to carve you know nice to ride okay so using a big big foil and a big um wing that makes a lot of sense and then, yeah, so you have that super easy start package now where um, I yep. guess it's it's made um, particularly with beginners in mind, yeah? So yep. it's same, so same base plate, same mast. Um, the fuselage is slightly different, but it's similar to our normal um, red fuselage. Um, the front wing sort of was based on a BSC wing, um, but we've rounded the ends off more so that you can't stab yourself so easily. Um, and we also, because we're, it's a different construction, we've made it out of polonial wood. Uh, so it's a solid wood core with a fiberglass laminate. Um, and that makes a strong wing that's a bit more affordable. Um, and we thinned the, the profile out a little bit on it, um, which is actually quite a good thing. It, it runs quite nicely and it's a, it's a fun setup to use. Okay, so and then right now you have it in two sizes. So basically one for the yep. um the bigger riders yep. with uh almost 2000 square centimeters and then one for um light, right lighter riders with um 1668 square centimeters 
So yep. both both of those should have plenty of lift, right? Yeah, well, yeah. I think a lot of people, when you're getting into foiling, you know, they walk into a store and there's just so many foils and it's all so confusing and they just, I don't even know where to start. Um, this breaks it down to, are you over 80 kg or less than 80 kg? This is the one that'll work for you. And it makes it a lot easier um, and they can go away, get started, have fun um, and work it out from there. Okay. And then obviously also using a, a, a floaty stable board, especially when you're starting out, definitely makes it easier, right? Yep, yep, yeah. Some of our learner boards are, have ridiculous amounts of volume in them. Um, we work with a school in Auckland here, and we've got a board there that's, I think it's six foot eight. And it's, I don't know, it's 160 litres or something. It's crazy volume. Mm, yeah. Um, they've used that with the um, 1040, um, SES package and it just gets people up and going it's not you, you don't necessarily ride it too many times because it's such a big board but no matter you know someone can stand on it wobble around easy to get up and going you've got to make it easy I think for beginners you know it's not um, it's not it's not an easy not a super easy sport to learn at the start so you've got to make it so that everything lines up easy and not too hard to get into yeah, I mean, I would say though, like you progress pretty quickly past that beginner board stage. So, um, so I, I would recommend yeah. instead of buying one, maybe either borrowing a big board or, um, you know, using a big stand up foil board or, or just renting one. I mean, or taking a lesson. And then if you uh, have a school near you, that's the, the, the best yes. thing is to take a lesson from a school and they can, you know, work you through a couple of boards so that the, by the time you buy a board, it's something you're actually going to hang on to for a little bit because you do move down. You're right. You do move down very quickly through the boards. And then in terms of uh, like, that, I mean, that those are good tips for equipment, but what about technique or um, conditions and so on? What kind, What are some other selecting, tips? Selecting good conditions are, are really important, like finding somewhere that's not too choppy um and you know if there's waves and stuff it's kind of hard work to swim out through waves and try and you know get up and going while there's waves around so if you can find a sheltered harbor or lake situation to learn that makes it a lot easier and finding wind you know like i said before getting up and going is the difficult thing so if you you can still learn the lessons of standing up and, and holding the wing and getting things in, in five knots but you, you're unlikely to get up and going so when you're ready to get up and going, you need sort of 15, 18 knots to get up and going, really. It makes it easier if there's a bit of breeze, a bit of power. Yeah, agreed that, yeah, ideally you want about a little bit, 15 to 20 knots maybe and, and smooth yeah. water if possible. And then also yeah. a place where you can, um, if, you, if you end up drifting downwind where it's easy to get back upwind or, or you know, where you don't end up uh, getting blown offshore or something like that. Yeah, our local beach, Manly here, um, is really good for learning. You know, you start at the top end, you go out, you make a couple of passes, and if you get going, good. If you don't, you sort of slowly drift down the beach and end up on the beach and just walk back up the beach again and have another go. It's, you know, you don't want to be in an offshore situation where you, without other people around where you're going to get blown away, for sure. Okay, great. Yeah, those are some good tips, I think, for people starting out. And... Um, so let's talk a little bit about you, um, your background, like where, you know, where did you grow up and how did you get into water sports? How did you get into the um, foiling industry or, you know, water sports industry? So um, I was actually born in America. I was born in Chapel Hill in North Carolina. My father was going to university there and I lived there till I was about two. And then I moved back to New Zealand and to Auckland, New Zealand and, and kind of grew up here. Um, I spent time in, my father did a sabbatical leave from university and I lived a year in Bristol when I was about, I don't know, maybe 10 or something. Um, and then, but I basically grew up at the beach in, in Rossay Bay in Auckland. Um, I had a, a P class, a little sailing dinghy and I learned to sail yachts um, as a young kid. I had a boat and did lots of fishing and stuff, mucking around from there. Um, and some of my mates started getting windsurfers and it was the early, early, early days of windsurfing. And I wanted a windsurfer as well. And my parents wouldn't buy me one. Um, I was 14 or something, I think at the time. And my mother 
offered to help me build one. So I did lawn mowing rounds and got the money for it. And I actually found a, a recipe for a windsurfer in a French magazine. And I had to learn French so that I could translate it. You didn't have internet back then, then so it was a bit more tricky. Um, and I, I built the windsurfer myself from, from scratch in the back, back room. It was polystyrene, so there's bubbles everywhere in the back living room of the house. And um, it was plywood skinned, and I made the sail and the mast and the boom and all the various bits of it. And my mother helped me with that. So um, I think they were trying to just help me uh, you know, learn to do things for myself. Um, and they had ideas of me going to university and everything, but I just sort of got so struck by windsurfing and building things that I kind of got into that and I've done that ever since. Um, I got a job at a windsurfing shop when I was about 18 years old and I learned to laminate and I also worked in sales in the shop. Um, and then when I was- Where was this? Where was this? This, this is in Auckland. In Auckland, in Auckland. Auckland. okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. And then when I was 19, uh, 20, I decided to, to move to Hawaii. And I actually came to um, Oahu because I thought that was the spot to go to. And I was in um, Lanakai. What's the spot there? I worked for Windsurfing Hawaii. Lanakai, for a, Kailua, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kailua Bay. And I yeah. windsurfed there for a bit. Um, but after a month or so, everyone kept coming back from Maui and raving about Maui. So I thought, oh, I better go to Maui. So I, I rang a mate of mine used to work for a shop in um, in Maui, Sailboards Maui. So I rang Sailboards Maui and asked if they had any work. And they said, oh, maybe try the factory. So I rang the factory and I got hold of some guy called um, Jimmy Lewis. And um, he said, what do you do? And I said, oh, I'll laminate. And he said, well, our laminator left yesterday. How soon can you get here? So I flew over and Jimmy gave me a job at Sailboards Maui. And that was run by Mike Walsh and uh, Fred Haywood and, and Jimmy. And it was in the old in the old cannery um, and that so I worked there for a, a year or so uh, and did that and that was great fun and I kind of went back and forwards between Hawaii and um, and and uh, and New Zealand and when I when I came back to New Zealand I, I started shaping boards Jimmy had given me a few ideas about shaping so I learned learned to shape boards in New Zealand and and built wind surface um, I had many. So, so the, sorry, the time in you are in Maui. What, when was that? Like in the eighties or um, eighty three or something like that was when. Oh, I first okay. Started. Okay. It was pretty early on. Um, right. Because only a year or so since um, Mike Walsh had sort of discovered who Keeper as a windsurfing destination. So it was great. That's you know, when they just was, like started using foot straps and like tiny boards yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. Right? yeah. 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 It wasn't that long after harnesses even. It was early days. So. Right. You know, things develop quite quickly there. And over the trips, I worked for, for various people. I worked for Angulo um, as a fiberglasser for, for years. And then um, I ended up getting a job working for um, Peter Tommen, who was um, the F2 shaper. And yep. he built all um, Bjorn Dunkerbeck and Britt Dunkerbeck's race boards and, and most of the World Cup team. So I did all the board building for them. And there was another guy who did the sanding and finishing. and Peter did all the shaping and learned so much there. Peter was really, really great and um, very analytical with the way he did things. And um, it was a pretty good situation too, because they had, it was the, the heyday of, of windsurfing and there was plenty of um, money for things. So we could try anything and, you know, anything we tried, it didn't necessarily have to be sold to make money, you know, it worked, it didn't work. We learned something from it, move on, you know, it was, so we learned a lot about construction quite quickly and had a lot of fun with that. So I did board building with that forever. Um, and in my time when I was coming back and forwards, I started a company in New Zealand called Underground. And it was underground windsurfers at the time. And I built underground windsurfers for years. Um, and I built them in Auckland originally. And then uh, built them in, I'd, one of the times I came back from Maui, I ended up being in Christchurch. So I, I built a factory in Christchurch and, and built windsurfers there. Um, I'd windsurfed at that stage for a lot of years and I was kind of a little bit bored with it, um, especially if it wasn't decent waves or whatever. And the local conditions weren't that exciting. And then um, we saw videos of kite surfing and, you know, 
from Maui and some of the early, early stuff and thought that looks cool. So thought we'd get into that. So we started building boards and found a guy in Ashburton, Peter Lynn, um, and he was building <coughs> kites and he was selling them in Europe. So we sort of ended up hooking up with him and um, building um, kite boards. And, you know, we, we started just doing Peter Lynn kite boards, but then we, we did more and more underground kite boards and we sold those all around the world and did that for years. Um, built the factory up, had a lot of guys working full time and it was, it was, it was pretty full on. And then one day we had a fire and everything got burnt, gone overnight. So we lost oh, the yes. factory, um, the retail store, um, sale loft, everything was gone and kind of had to rebuild from scratch. And that was an absolute mission. And by the time I'd re redone that, I'd, I'd started to lose a lot of, a bit of enthusiasm for that. I just needed a break. And um, a guy in uh, China offered to buy and my label underground and the whole setup and that their construction system. So <clears throat> sold that and moved that to China. And um, I went back and forwards and learned, learned to work in China basically. And, and that didn't go so well for, for them for, for various other reasons of things that happened in China at the time. And the underground label sort of went bankrupt. And that was a bit of a sad time, but it wasn't my baby anymore, but it was still kind of something I'd created. So it was a bit, bit sad. And at that stage, um, Evan, who, who I work with in the States, um, he had been selling my underground boards in, in San Francisco for years. And he was one, of, he was the first to sell my underground boards there. And he sort of said, look, you know, what you had was, was too good. Let's start something new. So we came up with the name Axis uh, and originally we were building kite boards uh, and we did that. And then um, Evan got hooked on foiling and tricked me into getting hooked into foiling mm -hmm. and started with kite foiling and then learned to sup foil and did sup foiling for quite a long time. And then um, when winging came along, got into that. And How did know. you come up with the name Axis? I'm curious. We had a lot of different, that was a struggle. Um, and we had a lot of different names. Um, one of the problems with underground was always fitting it on the board. It's such a, a long name. It always became a little skinny ribbon on the bottom of the board. So we figured it had to be something about three or four letters long. And, you know, it took it took a long time. But what we liked about Axis was, it, you know, with kite surfing, it was um, rotating around an axis. So a lot of the, the kite loops were spinning around an axis. Jumps are off axis. Um, axis is a, a pivotal moment as well. It just, it, I don't know, it kind of made sense and I kind of like it. And okay. it, you never know with a name. You you start with something and it changes to what the sport changes and it doesn't fit anymore. But I think Axis is, is a good good name. I like it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so then you got, you got into um, kite foiling. Keep going. <laughs> kite foiling and then and then sup foiling uh, and did that in Christchurch a lot and sort of developed sup foils to a, to a point. We, we started doing that and we started using our original um, mast that we had back in the day. And it was um, an OEM mast. It was only 15 mil thick aluminium and it was pretty wobbly. And our first wings that we built were, you know, 920 sort of span. And we pretty quickly realized that that mast just wasn't going to work. So um, while a lot of other companies were jumping onto the sport and, and building product, you know, we were desperate keen to build product, but we kind of felt like everything needed to be redesigned. And, so starting with that mast, you know, we worked out that uh, it, for kite foiling, it was kind of okay at about 750, but at 900, it was just a noodle and it was impossible to use. So we worked out that it needed to be 224% stiffer to be the same feel at 900. So that mm -hmm. was our target figure. And we actually came up with our original 19 mil aluminium mast, which we still build now. And that was, it was 224% stiffer than the original. And it was only an 8% weight gain. So 
when when you build a, an aluminium extrusion, you can you can draw it up on the computer and you can analyze the bending moment of it and and change see the stiffness. You can you can work out how long a mast is going to be, how much it's going to weigh, how stiff it's going to be, and, and analyze all that way before you even build it. So we went went through that and did that and and came up with a 19 mil mast. Originally, it was designed for subfoiling and relatively slow speeds, and it's absolutely fine for that. Um, it's actually fine for winging as well, but as the sport has evolved and things have got going a lot faster, um, 19 mils is kind of thick um, and it's not, not, not perfect for high speed tow foiling, for example. But the stiffness we felt is really, really important. And that's something that we've, we've always run with, with our foils from day one. Um, yeah, I mean, the, that, that the stiffness of the whole setup, I mean, not just the mass, but also the way the fuselage connects to the front wing and all that, that's kind of what sold me on Axis and why I started using it. And, uh, and also, of course, the many different wing designs you have available and always the evolving with more and more. So, uh, yeah, so we'll get into the gear, but so, so then basically, um, just wanted to finish the story of like how you got into this. So. So then from the making foils for stand-up paddling. Um, yeah, so then what, 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 what was the evolution from there? Well, um, we also, as a sideline back then, we, we built um, a foil for windsurf foiling, and it was a 900 span, and I can't even remember how narrow the cord was, but it was, it was quite a narrow high aspect wing at the time. You know, it was completely different to anything else. And um, we ended up using it for surfing a lot and, and for prone and for, um, for SUP as well. And that was kind of a turning point as of, of discovering that wings don't have to be these low aspect, you know, big fat piggy things. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And that was, the, that was the first wing that I used for the 900 was the first wing that I used when I went winging. So, um, okay, so, and then it's, it seemed like when you first started Axis, it was more focused on board, board building and so on, right? And now it seems like you're more focused on foils. Like what's your percentage of like foil sales versus board sales kind of what, approximately? Well, I don't, um, I don't know exactly without looking at a thing, but I, I um, you know, we, we, I've spent a lifetime building boards and I feel like I've tried just about everything that you can try. And um, very quickly, I can say, yep, that works, doesn't work. And I know that because I know it inside out. And then foiling came along and I didn't really know how to build hydrofoils. And um, just kind of the way that I work, like I questioned everything. You know, there was other foils on the market and, you know, they were doing, you know, um, Everything that, like, for example, some of the early foils, the front wing was set at the same angle as the fuselage. And I kind of said, well, why is that? And everyone said, oh, it's just, just how it is. And it's kind of had been, you know, the first people did that, and then everyone just copied that. And I tried to question everything that we did and try yeah. and work out. I, I think if you can understand the reason for something, it makes it a lot easier to, to nut out what, how you're going to build it better. I, I try and do that with customers as well. When I'm talking to people, I probably give them too much information, but I try and educate them so that they can actually understand it and then they can make a sensible decision because it kind of makes sense. Um, but that that front wing fitting on there, for example, we, you know, every foil that we analysed has a, an angle of attack where, like, obviously more angle of attack, you, you generate more lift, a flatter angle of attack you generate less lift, but it can go faster. Every foil section uh, has a different sort of sweet spot. And you can analyze that. And, you know, our original wings, we set at about two degrees to the fuselage. And now the, the modern ART HPS, they're set at, at one, one degree to the fuselage. The idea being that the, the fuselage is running, for the most part, through the water in a straight line, like an arrow not dragging like this, not, you know, up or down, just straight through. Mm -hmm. that, that foil angle changes as you go faster and slower, but generally for most of you, your riding, it, it's, it's running straight. Yeah. And I, and I guess, um, I like, I, I know a lot of people shim their, um, their plate mount um, between, you know, between the board and the plate mount and that kind of, I guess, 
if the board has, it seems like if the board has a little bit of tail rocker, then the board, uh, you know, you can lift up on the foil, but it, you know, like, I guess if, if the, I noticed that if the, if the foil is angled up too much, then when you're flying at high speeds, you end up flying with the nose slightly pointed downward. And then that's yeah. like catastrophic if you touch down because you're basically wipe out right away. And um, so it seems like it's easier, definitely easier to control the foil once it's up. If the nose is, if, an, if anything, a little bit higher, flying a little bit high than or flat, but definitely not pointed downwards, right? Yep. Um, I, I think with your board, when it, well, my fingers don't go straight anymore, but yeah. um, when a board touches down, um, if it touches down tail first like that, it's going to crash pretty badly. If, if it touches down nose first, obviously that's a complete disaster. You yeah. want it to touch about where the base plate is or just in front and mm -hmm. it'll just pop back up again. So right. that's the angle that you need to set your board at. And, mm -hmm. you know, generally when I build an axis foil and an axis board, everything works together with no need for any shim on the base plate. But right. off using an axis foil with some other board, and there's nothing wrong with that, but sometimes you need to adjust the angle that the board flies on a little bit with, right. it, with a back plate shim. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, because, yeah, basically if you add more angle to the front wing, uh, that, that angle of attack, um, it's a little bit easier to take off. Like the takeoff speed is, is lower a little bit, but then at the same time, um, sometimes it's harder to control at high, higher speeds. I've noticed, I've noticed like if it have too, has too much angle, but yeah. So ideally if it's tuned right, you want it to be kind yep. of easy, easy to lift off, but also easy to control at higher speeds. So. It, it should just run along without too much, you know, lifting up or dropping down. It should just run along nicely. I've actually just, I got pissed off with the whole shimming thing because it seems to be a complete and utter confusion for most people. Um, and a couple of three days ago, I just wrote it, wrote, I sat down and explained it all and wrote it all down properly. And we're actually adding it to our brochure and it will be in there. Um, and it explains shimming of the rear wing and also base plate shimming and like I said before, if you explain it to people, it's, it's pretty basic. Um, and once it's explained, it's a lot easier to understand. Um, happy to go through that a little bit and explain that. Um, the, yeah. the shimming of the rear wing. Um, the shimming the rear wing? Yeah, let's, yeah. let's get into that. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I find that I, my on my axis wings that I've used, I've been able to just use them without any shims um not How much really necessary you but i guess yeah i have tried adding uh the shim in the tail in the back but uh i didn't really How much do you weigh? sorry go ahead oh How much I'm, do you I'm, weigh? Like, uh, I'm like 195 pounds 195 pounds which is i think around 90 kilo or around yeah around 90 kilos so you're you're the correct weight if you're the correct weight same as me, um, then everything should run smoothly. If you're outside that weight range, if you're really light or if you're really heavy, then adding some shims helps a little bit. Okay. So um, just, I've got some bits here to try and explain it. There's your fuselage and there's your front wing and that bolts on. That front wing there, this is an ART uh, 799. Um, Axis always does their wings by span. I can go into that later as well, but that, that front wing is set at one degrees to, to the fuselage. Um, the more angle of attack, uh, the more lift, the less angle of attack, uh, the faster it goes. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll try and explain this as, as well at the moment now. So the angle that this wing flies at, you can't trick the wing into riding at a different angle. That right rides at the angle that it wants to ride at. And um, more angle of attack is more lift and then less angle of attack is less lift. It happens, I'll, I'll quit that. Stupid mail, I've got mail come in. Yeah, um, it was my mail app too. <laughs> but, um, when you're riding along, it, you know, if you're riding at too much of an angle of attack, the foil will come up and it will jump out of the water and you'll crash. If you're riding at too low an angle of attack, the foil will drop down and you, your board will hit the water. Um, so you don't actually have to think about it. Your wing automatic, you automatically set the angle of that wing so that it's about right for this. And the, the angle of that wing rides at is dependent on your weight 
and how fast you're going. So I generally set, set it all up for winging <clears throat> and, you know, around 85 kg. So if, if you're, you know, most of the wings will run straight, no shims, no need for anything at, at, if you're around about that weight. Now, so the front wing is angled up slightly, one degree. Um, the rear wing, this is a 325, um, that's actually angled downward slightly. So the front one's angled up, the rear one's angled down. The reason that's angled down is it actually, and the foil section's upside down, so it's actually pushing downwards. That downward force actually pro provides a, a lifting force which balances against your front foot. When you're foiling, you have um, a front foot pressure and back foot pressure, and you're basically standing around that wing and, and you know, trying to balance nicely on that. The, the size of this rear wing, uh, the bigger it is, the more force it, it gives you. And when you're learning and you're more clumsy, you need more force to actually balance against. But as you get better, you can use smaller and smaller wings and you need less, less to balance against. So that back wing as stock on the fuselage, um, the progressive wings, that's angled downwards at one and a half degrees. So the most important thing about, about shimming is the angle between the front wing and the back wing. So if that front wing is angled up at one degrees, the back wing is angled down at one and a half degrees, the difference between the two is two and a half degrees. So that number, two and a half degrees, that's it. That's the one that actually matters and that's the one that counts. Everything else is hoo-ha. You know, the angle to a tree over there or whatever, it doesn't make any difference. This is the one and a half degrees. This one degree here, two and a half degrees difference. Now, um, the shims that we have, the stock ones that you can download and get is the, that's a positive shim and that is a negative shim. Now, the reason for the naming convention on that, which here's the biggest confusion, is because a lot of companies use something different on that. Now, to get more front foot pressure, if you're heavier uh, and you need a bit, you, you want this rear wing to be more active, you need to angle it down a bit more. That makes it do its job a little bit more. So that if you add a, a degree of angle down, this rear wing is now on two and a half degrees. So you've got one, plus two and a half, you've got three. So I describe that as positive shimming because it's 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 in addition to what the original one was. Three and um, a half, you mean, yeah, three and a half. Three and a half, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. With the, uh, if, you, if you flatten it off, if you're lightweight or, or can cope with a, a flatter angle on the rear, um, the wing, the, the foil will run faster, um, but it'll be a bit more twitchy and a bit harder to balance, unless you're smaller and then it'll be perfectly comfortable for you. So if you reduce the angle of that rear, you've got one degree at the front. Let's say you've reduced this one degree at the back. This is only now half a degree. So you've got a difference of one and a half degrees. So I call that a negative shim because the number is smaller than the stock. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Much easier if you can kind of talk about it in those terms because at the moment everyone talks to each other and says, oh, yep, you know, I've done negative shimming. Is that negative or is it not negative? You know, no, there's a, no established terminology as to why it would be negative or positive. I've seen some videos of some guys trying to explain it and I've sat through the whole thing. And at the end of it, I had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> How's the customer yeah. supposed to actually look I, at that? I like how you, yeah, I like how you explain it as the difference between the front and the back. Do you, do you have anybody that's shimming the front angle, the wing, uh, the angle of the front wing? At all, or not really? Not, re not really. Um, you can, um, on an axis wing, you could actually uh, put a packer in here. Yeah. And we, we have done that. And so the wing has got more angle of attack at the front. Yeah. But all that's going to do is, uh, you know, like I said before, this, this wing finds its own way. Mm. Um, so all you're really adjusting is the angle of the fuselage. Right. Th this is unchanged. Yeah, yeah. You no, that makes sense. Yeah, because I mean, but basically you want the... Um, fuselage to be flying more or less um, parallel to the um, to the water surface, right? right? I mean, you that's don't the, want that to be dragging uh, either yeah. direction. Yeah. yeah, that's the intent. But but in, with that in mind, like as 
you know, when you take off, when you first take off, you actually have a slightly more angle of attack. And then right. as you go faster and faster, you flatten that off. So the angle of the fuselage is, it's not absolutely always going to be parallel to the water, but right. we set it so that when you're at your average sort of speed, it's generally sort of going dead flat parallel to the water, low drag. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay, Adrian, I'm going to, I'm going to like, since we're talking about equipment and stuff, I'm going to get into some questions here. I got these questions from uh, guys in New Zealand, uh, from Dan, our distributor. I keep collected some questions for you from his, from his friends. So, um, so the first question was, um, you know, regarding weight, like um, that, you know, saying, he's saying the axis gear is heavy compared to other foils. Any thoughts on developing a lighter, uh, high modulus mass and carbon fuselage and what effect does weight really have when under the water so can you talk a little bit about the effect of the weight yep um as far as I, like i wouldn't say axis is heavy i would say it's actually like i said before the stiffness of the mast like the stiffness of everything like the the front wing the way it joins to here is really important. That joint is really important. Mm -hmm. The joint from the fuselage to the mast is, is critical. The stiffness of the mast is critical and, you know, the stiffness of the whole thing. If you've got wobble or play or anything, you, you lack control of that front wing, you're only riding that front wing. That's basically what you're riding. So anything that compromises that attachment to the front wing is not going to make riding better. It's going to make it more difficult because it's wobbling around and not connected to you. So. Um, I actually think that Axis is a realistic weight. And I think that some of the ones that you might be comparing it to, um, the mast is not sufficiently stable. Uh, the joins are not sufficiently stable. And, you know, like if you were selecting foils and, and you, you, you were looking at the important things, um, the weight might be question number 234. And by the time you get to that question, everything else is eliminated anyway. So I don't, agree that axis is a heavy setup i think some of the other ones are actually too 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 soft altogether yeah and i would agree with that i mean that's uh, in my in my opinion like the ax like the yeah the rigidity comes first and then the weight is like in my my opinion like a secondary concern after rigidity and and also the foil because the foil is underwater and like uh the has a basically a lower center of gravity than the board and everything above the water it um i think the weight on the foil seems to matter less than the weight of, of what's above the water and i've you know i've had an, a prototype early on that was cnc uh, cnc'd out of a solid block of g10 fiberglass and yep. the front wing was like a kind of a heavy you know beginner wing and it was super heavy and I, I thought it'd be impossible to use because it's so heavy, you know, it was really heavy to carry to the water and stuff like that. But then in the water, it felt really solid. Like it had a very, like basically a low center of gravity. It's like a keel. And even when I was flying it, it felt very, um, very stable. So, the, yeah. so I guess the weight is not in, in a foil or in the fuselage is not always a bad thing. I would, I would say. We've, we've used G10 to prototype quite a few of our rear wings and yeah. um, it, it's, you know, it's good for testing out. It's not, ideally, it's not really stiff enough. And as the wings become more high aspect, like the, the that 799 that I had there before, something that's long and skinny like that, you build that in G10, it's going to be too floppy to even use. It's just not going to be stiff enough. Right. So, um, yeah, the, the, the rigidity is, is, is really important. Um, I, one of my favorite wings that I'm riding at the moment, it's, uh, I think it's a, a 1100 span um, and it's got a mean average cord of about 89. So it's, and it's quite thin, uh, but we built it in several different constructions. And one of the constructions, just as a test, we built it out of solid carbon all the way through. The wing itself is about two and a half kilograms you know, you give it to people and it's, it's just, you know, you just about drop it. It's really, really heavy. Rides fine. I can't even feel any difference to it. So um, I don't think weight is as important as a lot of people think. I do think there is a, there is a, a, a change to that. And that is like, if you're riding with your foil in the water, so if you're toe foiling, if you're um, surfing, if you're winging, 
you know, most of the things like if the foil is in the water most of the time, no problem at all. But if you're doing freestyle, if you're doing jumps and spins and tricks, you know, having a lighter weight uh, uh, mast and, and foil um, so that you can do your freestyle stuff, that would for sure be better. But yeah, also rotations a, and things. It's a great. massive compromise. It's a massive compromise for when you're foiling along on a straight line because you just lost that connection. Yeah, agreed. So then the next question was uh, regarding foil design. Are we fast approaching a point of peak performance for foils where we can't get much better and where, where to go from there? No, um, I think we're just getting started. That's the fun part. Yeah, I agree. I think there's still so much R&D to do and, and um, things. I mean, it seems like every time something new comes out, it's like a, a big jump forward. So um, I don't I don't think we'll I, that we're anywhere close to being at the point of peak performance. I should poke that in there at this time. Yes, that's the new mass. So, yeah, we, we talked about this earlier, but you said you're just getting ready to release this. And I guess by the time I'm posting the interview, this is going to be available right yep yep it's actually well we're doing the release but we don't necessarily have stock ready to send out um we were trying we normally when we do a release we actually have stock built and it's all ready to go but in this case here it's you know taking time to build a decent amount of stock and there's too many people have seen this mast already um, and they're asking questions and we can't really answer the questions because you know it's not officially released so we've kind of had to just say, right, let's do it. So um, this is a, a 750 version of, of the Axis Power Carbon Mast. Now, the Power Carbon Mast comes in um, a high modulus and it comes in a standard modulus construction. Um, our previous carbon masts that we've done, they, they were not as stiff as our 19 mil aluminium mast. Um, but they were thinner, like a 19 millimeter mast is an extrusion. So it's 19 mils top to bottom. So that means you're pushing 19 mils through the water. Perfectly fine for a learner, for SUP, for a lot of things. It's absolutely fine for, for dock start pump where the, the rigidity of the mast is really important. Fantastic mast for that. But with the advent of more high aspect wings and running faster, um, it, 19 mils is just too thick. So um, the new power carbon mast, the bottom section of the mast here where it goes into the fuselage, the bottom 300 mils is about 15 mils thick, and then it gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And 100 mils down, it's still, it's still 20 mils thick. Um, when, you, uh, like when you design anything on computer, you can use um, finite element analysis, and you can actually bend that mast and see where the stress in it is. And, when you, when you bend it, all of the stress is concentrated around this area here on a mast. And you know that from all of the masts that have, you know, failed in the shop. They always kink at the base plate or, or break there. So one of the most important things, if you want to try to build a decent mast, is that it's one piece. The fibres from here run all the way down and right through and into the base plate. Any, any sort of a join in here, to me, seems like, way too much of a compromise. This is the most important part of building a stiff mast. So uh, back to the stiffness of this, this mast, like the two versions, the, the standard carbon one is 25% stiffer than the 19 mil aluminium. And the high modulus one is 35% stiffer. Now that's a massive amount. And the first time I rode this mast, um, I was using the 1099 wing. So um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but like in terms of that, the, how do you measure the stiffness? Is it like torsional stiffness or side bending or like how, how do you um, define my, that? So what I do is I bolt that mast to a wall. And then at this end here, I hang 25 kilograms off these two bolts mm -hmm. and I measure the deflection at the, at the sharp edge of the back of the mast. So, so, so it's the sideways bending. I mean, yeah. Sideways really, bending. But, so this but, is, but what about the torsional stiffness? Because that's really important as well, right? The, the twisting. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. So that, that's one way of bending. So I isolate the, the both. So that purely okay. is only bending, testing for sideways bend. Yes. Um, the other bend we do is we put a fuselage on there. We use a, uh, a standard fuselage because it's got the longest uh, tail section on it. 
and I put a pivot point here to the ground, to a concrete floor, so that the mask can no longer bend sideways at all. Um, and then off the rear uh, screw, um, I hang 25 kilograms and I measure the deflection of the fuselage at the end. So that's measuring the, the twist force of the mast only. Okay. Poor little mast with 25 kg hanging off the back of the fuselage. It gets quite a twist in it. Yeah. You know? so, so, and, uh, and so that, that extra 25 or 35% stiffer, is that the case in both directions? Or like, because I, I know like depending on how you lay up the carbon inside the, the, the carbon layer, the direction of the carbon makes a big difference on the that torsional yeah. stiffness, right? For sure, you can yeah. you can do a lot with that. But the truth is, to, to get a mast as stiff as the 19 mil aluminium mast, it would need to be 19 mil thick all the way through, and you, you know you can't do that because of the you know this is 15 mil, so it's lower drag down here. So um, the torsional rigidity is about the same as the aluminium mast, but yeah. the sideways bend is a lot more. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. when you when you ride it, like a, the first ride I, I ever had on the, the high modulus mask when we finally built one, um, I was on the 1099 and the mask was 900 length. The other thing is the length obviously is a, is a big change. So if you're comparing the bend from one mask to another, you have to compare a, a 750 to a 750 or a, an 820 to an 820 or a 900 to a 900. As it gets longer, the movement at the end is going to be longer, just the nature of how it is. Um, so my first go was on a, a 1099 front wing, uh, a 900 um, power carbon high modulus, and it was the first time ever that I'd felt that connection to the front wing. You know, I felt totally connected so I could carve and do whatever. Um, you were talking about weight weight before. This mast is not really any lighter than the the 19 mil aluminium with a base plate and a doodad in it. Hmm. But the stiffness and the feel, the connection is just through the roof. And it, I mean, to me, and the, there's quite a big price difference too, right? They, is it cost probably like, like almost 10 times as much as an aluminum mast, right? Definitely expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, purely, so, like, one thing I wanted to mention for those of you um, um, who are interested in, in getting a, a stiffer mast is that it, what really makes a difference too is, is um, like you said, the length of the mast. Obviously, if, if you have a longer mass, you need it needs to be stiffer, basically. So if you if you're lightweight using a narrow wingspan, smaller foil, or um, yeah, or and or a shorter mass, you can get away with using a, a more flexible mass. And also in the surf, sometimes having a little bit of flex, you kind of get used to it. But if you if you're a heavier rider, if you're going fast and you're using a wider wingspan, a bigger wingspan foil and and you're yeah and you're going faster than in all those situations i think that you really notice the mass flex like it really affects the performance even when you're doing downwinders and just taking off with a big foil if there's some mass flex the whole setup feels very unstable and bouncy right you're always going to have mass flex that's just the nature of it you've got you know 900 mil away from your board you've got a, a big foil it's a long dangly thing it, there's going to be some movement it's it's never um i don't think you can get too stiff um with that in mind we had a team rider in australia and um he's light he's uh, about 70 kg and he he pumps for like an hour you know from wave to wave to wave connecting and i sent him uh an 820 that's the length he rides um of the high modulus and the normal modulus carbon and he rode both and he was amazed you know at how stiff the 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 normal carbon was um but after riding both he kind of said why wouldn't you have the extra stiffness you know the stiffness it's more expensive um and i think it's better um but like you said if you're a, a lighter weight person if you're riding a smaller foil and a shorter mast you'd probably you know the other one's fine but the high modulus is the is the stiffest. Good point about the stiffness. I think it's yeah, and for most people, stiffer is just gonna work better. And I wanted to apologize. My camera is going crazy up here. I don't know what's wrong with it. I have to check the settings, but I can't really do it right now. But anyways, um, so another question here is what is now considered the fastest foil combo? I guess in the foot in your range, and what is the recommended axis track positioning? 
set up on a new Blue Planet Wingmaster if using straps. So, I mean, I don't, that's something I can answer, but I guess you can answer the first part about the fastest foil combo. Um, I guess the fastest at the moment would be the 799 uh, and paired with either a, um, a 380 or a, the, the, the high aspect 380 rear or the um, like a 325 or a 300 rear would be considered the, the fastest setup we've got at the moment. Um, I, I guess the ART range, um, what we've tried to do with that is make something that's really glidey and easy to use and fun to use. Um, it was never intended to be the fastest wing in the world. It, it actually goes pretty fast, but the, the glide is perhaps the most amazing um, thing with it. Um, we are working uh, a lot on more race stuff now for, for, um, for downwinding. And we will have stuff. We're doing a lot of stuff with um, James Casey because he wants to, you know, have race gear for downwinding. I should say, like, while we're talking about that mast there, um, like when we came out with that stiffer mast, you know, loved it. Amazing. You know, huge difference. Massive leap forward. But we also noticed that all of a sudden we could feel flex in the front wing, the, the narrow high spec front wings, we could feel differences in that. You could never feel that with a softer mast because everything was just moving. But now with a stiffer mast, you can isolate that. So we've actually gone back and, and, and um, you know, analyzed the flex in the wings and, and done all sorts of different constructions in, in the front wings to, um, to, to stiffen them up and, and change the way that is. And so construction is becoming far more important part uh, of wing building. Like if you think back to the early days with the 920 with a, a massive cord uh, and, you know, huge thick wing, the thing didn't flex much anyway, if at all. Um, but some of the wings now, like there's a prototype I've been writing at the moment. It's um, 1200 wide and it's got a mean average cord of 87. Uh, it's 13.4 um, aspect ratio. And it, wow. it, to get that to hold together is quite some trick. And again, a wing like that, there's just no way you could have used it on the old mast or uh, even the aluminium because it runs too fast for that. So um, this new mast for me is a huge breakthrough and it means that we can actually advance all sorts of things from here. Um, okay. But, so, so um, like, you also have that high performance speed range, but you're saying actually the ART range or the ART 799 is actually faster than the um, the high performance it, it, speed range. It has less cord. It it came before Just the higher ART. aspect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, when I mean, when I describe any when I describe any wing at all, my 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 way of analyzing it too is a bit different to a lot of other wings. So the first thing I, I look at is the span. How wide is the wing? Um, the next thing I look at is the mean average cord. The mean average cord is the, the cord is the difference distance from the, the back of the wing to the front of the wing. Um, the mean average cord is what's the average of the whole entire wing. Um, and then I look at the foil section that, that's been used inside to, to create that foil. And every foil section has a certain amount of camber in it. Camber is the, the amount, it's a line that's halfway between the, there's the top of the wing, there's the bottom of the wing, there's a line that's midway, halfway in between. That's the camber line and that's curved upwards. And if you compare that to a dead straight line, the cord line, you, you look at it as a percentage. So every foil has a, a certain amount of camber and generally it's between, you know, one or two, up to sort of 4% or 4.5% or camber. The higher the camber, the higher lift at lower speeds generally, um, and the flatter the camber, the faster the wing uh, goes. That wing you've got there, that's the ART, they're all a 2.5% a, a camber in them. And it's it's relatively low drag. And, and what I like about this, the whole ART range is the glide. Um, it, it just keeps on running and it's easy to use. I like I like the glide. Um, they are pretty fast because they've got quite a narrow cord. 
Um, but if you want to go faster than that, you need a faster foil section. And with a fa faster foil section, you also get other compromises in the performance. They're harder to get going. They don't work necessarily through such a wide range. So you become wings that are very, very specific for certain tasks. So, you know, the, the HPS, the BSC, HPS and ART, they're all a fairly general purpose foil section, which I would say is easy to use, you know, relatively fast for what they are and, and fun and easy, easy to drive. Um, to go beyond that to really, really fast stuff is going to take different foil sections and they won't be so user friendly. Yeah, so I want to share a little bit my own experience. So um, I was using for a long time um, using this one here, the um, BSC 740. And this is a really nice wing. I really enjoy this uh, for surfing. It's, it's like a nice all round kind of wing that carves well and so on. And then you recommended that I try this one here, the ART 899 and it has it has a bigger wingspan, so it's wider. Move back a little bit, but it also, um, but it has actually about the same surface area. I think pretty close to the same surface area. And what I noticed that, yeah, it has amazing glide. Like it, it, it um, just keep kind of keeps going. Once you, um, it just has less drag, less. It's more efficient. So when you're coming through, or going through attack or something like that. It just kind of keeps going a little bit longer, right? Like it, it just flies. Uh, it just keeps going running. Less yeah. drag, you know. And then good way um, to... I'm I'm also using yeah. the smaller tail wing, and then uh, the um, short. This is the 320, 325 tail wing, and yep. then the um, ultra short fuselage. So, and I've only used this a couple of times. So the first time I used it, I I also was using a shorter mass, so kind of everything a little bit different, and the, you know, first time I had to definitely get used to the different feel of it. But uh, now I notice I can get it going in about the same amount of wind. It seems like it needs slightly, a little bit, tiny little bit more wind to get going than this one. This one has a really nice low end. Like you can fly really slow and also take off pretty, pretty easily for considering how small it is. Um, but yeah, once you're going, it feels very efficient. You can go upwind. I can go upwind, I think at a steeper angle and so on so and then yeah compared i also have this one here the 700 that this one is the um i guess that is that the high, high speed or whatever it's called hps yeah hps yeah the 700 so this one has kind of i think a thinner profile it's it's a really fast foil but it takes also takes more speed to get it going and and it stalls a little bit sooner than i mean also because it's a small foil um so this this one I, I found um, for winging, it's only really good in really high high wind when you have enough, plenty of wind to get it going. Yeah, versus, you have to versus the whole this one, this one I think is going to be a good wing for me in, in any kind of conditions, not just um, strong wind. I, I kind of I I'm kind of the kind of person that once I find something I like, I'm not going to change it around a lot. You know, I just kind of get used to it and then. Um, you know, unless I have someone like you telling me to try something new, I, I don't really, I just kind of um, find something I like. What you like. And, and every, that's the beauty of foiling is you, you find what setup works for you and everyone's got a slightly different idea of what they want to do. Um, yeah. I, I hardly ever ride that 899 because for me, I like, I like glide. I like to drop my wing and just coast along surfing, you know, near invisible swells. So I need a bigger span for that. So I ride generally wings that are a 1,000 or 1,100 span, um, but probably no more cord than that one. The, the, the span, the wider the span, the more glide, uh, the, the bigger the cord, the more handbrake that's on. If you mm. cut the cord down, it just it just cuts the drag and it just keeps on rolling. And that 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 lower drag, like you know, you you find on that eight nine nine, you know, you'll sail through a gust and you're in a lull, and the thing will just keep running. It, it won't actually stop. Whereas if you're on your older, um, thicker, uh, bigger cord foil, there's more drag on it, and it wants to sort of run down and slow down. Whereas that one there just it just keeps on going. There isn't much drag, so that's why they're so good for downwinding as well, because they just don't 
once you're up, they don't slide slow down. A little bit tricky to get up, and you would have felt that the first time you had a go of it. You can't really use angle of attack to actually yeah. get up. Um, you need to almost, when you feel a lift coming, you almost need to hold it down and just yeah. do two more bumps to get up to speed, and then it just comes up and you're yeah. away. If you pop it up too early, it just kind of wants to stall you'll, or, or we be installed. Yeah, it is up down. Yeah, yeah see exactly. It. But that's pretty much normal with a high, little bit more high aspect flows. I've yep. noticed. The other thing I wanted to mention is like I switched from the black series short fuselage to the advanced fuselage uh, ultra short, and I noticed right away that um, you know holding them up against each other, if if you match the same mass, you know the mass in the same place. It's quite a bit longer in the front. Like th this is the short versus the um, ultra short, ultra yep. short, or um, yeah. So and then in the back, it's 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 about the same difference in the back as in the front. Like so, the diff it's it's shorter in the front and the back by almost the same diff the same amount. It, it is it is exactly the same. So the ultra short um, is exactly the same length um, fuselage yeah. overall, but the so are they both ultra short. No, no, one is short and one is ultra short. But I noticed, uh, yeah, so, um, the, yeah, so they're. So the advance is a new one that we've just come out with. And um, basically what it is, like the ultra short uh, is the same. This is, a good, this is a good chance to explain something here. So when we first started, uh, when we first started building the force, this is back in the, the 920, you know, the original first wing we ever did we uh we actually put the mast directly on top of the front wing and our theory was that from an engineering point of view that was the, the strongest point to attach it um and we went and foiled it it foiled fine but it didn't steer like you'd try and turn and you just fall off the side it didn't actually turn um and we thought perhaps the wing had uh too much turn down on the tips so we started um, making some new tips for it. And the, the rear wing was also doing um, some crazy stuff as well. So we started experimenting with the rear wing to try and change that. Um, and in as, as well as that, we also built uh, a fuselage with the mast further in a more sort of standard position in, in, the, in the fuselage. And straight away, we found that, that that's it. It actually worked fine. So um, after that, we actually built a whole series of fuselage with the mast in different positions, further, further forward and further back. The further back you have it, obviously, the more challenge it is to the mast torsionally. It actually tries to twist the mast more. You can imagine if you had the fuselage at the rear wing, um, you know, you'd have no control over your front wing. There'd be just too much flex and movement. Um, so we sort of found a spot that was kind of a sweet spot and it worked pretty well. And since then, from the uh, thickest point of the front wing to the mast has remained the same distance. We've done everything that we've designed has been the same. So uh, whether it's um, a red fuselage or a black fuselage, whatever wing, the thickest point is about the same distance from the mast. And we've just run with that. And that's worked pretty good. Um, but a while back, we thought probably with the super high aspect wings we're doing, as the cord gets narrower and narrower, the, the distance between the mast and the front wing starts to look quite great. So we thought it was a good time to revisit that. And so we built a bunch of black fuselage and we did them with, um, again, with the mast at all various positions. So the advanced fuselage is, is 40 mils further forward. Um, so when you use it, you have to move the base plate 40 mils further forward as well so that the wings are in the same place. When, when you're foiling your, your front wing, your, sorry, your front foot and your back foot is balanced over your front wing. Uh, yeah, so that, that's exactly what I just wanted to mention because that was part of the question too. Like when I was using the BSC with a, with a short fuselage, um, yep. the mat, the, the basically the wing is a little bit more forward. So I had to move the plate pretty much all the way back. You can kind of see the markings uh, like from the, rubber on the on board but this is kind of the back of my um plate mount and then with the sh ultra short you know there's like maybe like a, a difference where the the foil is um slightly further back so i had to move everything up by you know about that same close to that same amount um 
kind of the, the, the fuselage is shorter in the front basically uh for, for me that's but, what kind of how how it worked out so um, the advanced fuselage definitely needs moving moving forward, but it, it is slightly complicated, and that is the, right. the ART also, because it's such a straight across wing, um, if you consider the, the BSC, uh, the, the thickest point of the, of the front wing actually has some curvature as it goes out. So, you know, your, your average lift, if you like, for that front wing is slightly further back with the mm. ART, they're, they're relatively straight across. The, the tips are quite far forward um, and that means that when you go from if without changing the fuselage take the fuselage change out of the out of the, the equation when you change from the, the the bsc to the art the art probably needs to go back about 20 30 mil in the box to get the center of lift in about the same position yeah but then so you, i guess you, it's a combination of the fuselage being um, having closer or like the fuselage being shorter between the mass and the front wing and yep. also the the I guess the thickest part of the foil is a little bit further back on this wing than on this one is a little bit further forward right is that what you're saying? Um, the thickest point's sort of not that different in those two wings their thickness is very different and there's a lot of other things that are different but the 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 percentage point of the thickest point is about the same and those two foils okay um i should explain more about that so that, that well, what I, yeah what i'm saying is like because the cord is smaller so then if you if you look at the thickest point like you said it's about a third back or whatever so it's about here versus the uh, if you have a, a wing that has a thicker uh wider cord then that that center of the thickest part of the foil is a little bit further back right wouldn't no, uh, so the, the thickest, well, the thickest point of the BSC, the thickest point of that front wing is about the same as the thickest point of the ART. Oh, okay. They're, they're about the same, but obviously because it's got bigger cord, the front of the wing goes further forward, the back of the wing goes further back. But the thickest point, we've always done about the same. That's how we've done it. We've, we've set them all up with the thickest point of the wing about the same from wing to wing. But the fuselage you were mentioning there, that's an, a, an advanced fuselage compared to a normal one. So the normal one's here, the advance is 40 mils further forward. And simply what that and does. Another, another difference too is that it has um, thicker sidewalls, right? Like I, um, it's a little bit more, more beefy, right? That's they're about the same. I'm trying to look at them there. There's not a lot of difference in it. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I thought it. I thought it looked a little bit thicker. Like the sidewalls were a little bit more beefed up. I thought it's about the same design, but okay. it's just further forward. So the position of that mast. So you're riding your your front wing, and your feet are balanced around that front wing. So when you go for an advanced fuselage, you move you move the base plate 40 mils further forward. So your wings are on the same place, and your feet are in the same place. Nothing's changed, but the only thing that's changed is the position of the mast for, forward and backwards yeah. relative to everything. Now that mast is a bit like your fin position in a surfboard. Um, if you move a fin forward in a surfboard, it makes it looser. If you move it further back, it makes it more stable. Uh, and at, at a faster speed. Mm -hmm. So the position of that mast is, is, it affects the way it rides. So the advanced fuselage, moving the mast 40 mils further forward, hence the name advance. Um, the reason for that is for a more surfing situation. So if you're riding prone uh, or, or sup, or even if you're winging, but you're primarily trying to ride waves, the advanced fuselage is a, is a, you know, it, it does the job better and feels a lot better for that. Um, there's some negative effects for it as well. Our normal fuse with the mast further back um, is a lot more stable at winging speeds when you're going faster. Um, also, when you're trying to go upwind, um, you can drive against that mast and it goes upwind a lot better on our standard fuselage. So for most people, probably the standard fuselage is just perfect and there's no need to change anything. The advance is more for people that are dedicated to trying to surf. And in a surfing situation, um, it seems to go from 
we say rail to rail, but you know, you've got your, your wing in the water. So it goes from side to side in a in a smoother way. You don't get a power spike with the with the mast further back. You tend to turn, and then it gets a bit of a power spike. And same with your turn when you go the other way. With the mast further forward, it just seems to smooth it out, and it feels more like a surfboard turning. Yeah. So one thing I was surprised by with the um, the ART range was that. It, it feels really actually pretty easy to carve from rail to rail um, as compared to other um, high aspect foils that I've tried that have kind of more of a stiffer feel, right? So, so how did you achieve that? Well, so if we grab that, um, it's pretty hard to try and show it in there. This is a, an ART 799. So as this wing goes out, the tip is actually twisted off this way. Mm. right okay it's lifted up and the idea of that is that it's supposed to give the, the wing more, more range so you know i told you before that you are you have your angle of attack that you're riding on and as you go faster that that gets lower and lower you know that that gets flatter and flatter if you think of that tip which is lifted up as you get flatter the tip might actually be pointing downwards and creating negative lift and with that in mind, the very last foil section and the tip of that wing is actually a symmetrical foil section. So it's neither lifting, you know, it's just a foil section, a parallel foil section. Um, so we, we, we put that in there really just to give the foil more range, which it does do. But a weird side effect of that is when you tip it over to turn, the blade is twisted like a helicopter blade or, you know, a, a propeller blade, and it just pivots around that. And some of these wings, you know, they're very straight across, and it's not what you'd imagine a surfing wing should look like. But they surf unreal. They turn really, really good. Mm -hmm. And some of our prototype stuff, we've taken that to even more of an extreme. And, you know, the, 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 you, historically, we always thought that you needed sweep in the outline of the wing to make it surfy. But I, I don't believe that. So, I mean, some of the wings that I've had that are just the straightest, ugliest straight across wings I've ever ridden. Um, if you can get the twist right in it, you tip them over and they just turn beautifully. Interesting. Okay. So a little bit of a twist in the wing and, and change and basically, so they have a different profile in the, in the center versus the tip you know, tip is symmetrical and the center is more, um, it, I guess more of a, same, it's the same foil section all the way out. Yeah. But just the very last foil section that we put in the ART is a symmetrical foil section. And we should talk about the tip of that wing too. Like people say, why isn't that into a point? Um, with with a with a with a wing that with the Reynolds number of water, as you get to a, a smaller uh, point, the the like if it came out really, really skinny here, there's a bit where it just becomes drag. It's not actually doing any beneficial lift or anything. So we, we thought just to chop it off. And mm. um, it, what it does is it makes the wing more efficient. Um, so this is a 799 wing. It actually behaves like a, a slightly wider wing. It's almost got that phantom tip on there still. This, but, but you don't have the drag of that. So um, yeah. It's, Interesting. It's, it's also better if you hit the bottom. <laughs> yeah, well, it's better if you stick it into yourself. It's not quite so yeah, gnarly. That's true too. Yeah. Okay, here I have another question. Um, can us older 55 year old guys go as fast as the young guns? Um, mm -hmm. For that one, I would say watch last the last interview with Alan Cadiz on Maui's. Um, yeah, yes. he's 60 and he just beat everyone in the race, including uh, guys like Kai Lenny and stuff. So definitely you can still go fast at, at any age, I would say. Yep. Um, and then can the HPS wing be pushed as hard uh, go as fast as ART wings if they are similar size? Um, not, not really. They have more cord, so they're never going to go as fast as an ART. I think I describe wings a little bit differently. Like I, I, you know, I primarily look at the span. That's the most important thing to me. And then I said after that, the mean average cord. And then I'd, I'd analyze the foil section that was used, how much camber it's got. And then after that, um, I might go to the color of the wing, you know, whether it's blue or red or um, black or carbon or whatever. And then after that, I might consider area. So I guess what I'm saying is area is something that I, I just don't even take any notice of whatsoever. Um, I, might, I might look at volume before I look at area. So mm. 
um, a lot of wings are described by area, which, you know, is a bit of a nonsense to me. The, the span is the most important thing. And as, as kind of proof of that, um, the um, BSC 890 um, and the um, 980, sorry, the nine, I'm trying to think of three wings that are about the same span in our range, um, they all get going at about the same speed. But the narrower cord, it just goes faster. It's got less drag and it runs faster. Mm. Slight different trick to get it up and going, um, but it's really a, a, a trick rather than one doesn't go in lighter winds. You can still get the, the higher spec wings up, but you just have to have a slightly different technique to get them up. Right. Um, yeah, I've noticed that too. Okay. Span, so, um, span, span is the most important number. And if you're comparing wings, span, 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 and then mean average cord. And that tells you more than anything about a wing. Okay. So, I mean, actually a follow-up question would be, so what's, what's coming next? You said you're working on pro new prototypes where you're working on that twist and the, are they even more high aspect than the ART range or? Yeah, we've, we've done a lot of different stuff and we've got some stuff that's, you know, good genuine advances at the moment, but we still feel like we're making big gains. So we're just keeping on going with it. What, um, what about building flex into the wing tips of the front wing? I mean, because you were saying that, I mean, we kind of established that probably in the mass, you want it to be as rigid as possible and the kind of the connection between the mass and the fuselage and the board and everything you want super rigid. But what about having a little bit of twisting in the in the wing itself? Well, with the high aspect wings, you get a bit of that anyway. Right. <laughs> is, that a, is it good or bad? Um, it's more complicated than that. Um, like we, we built the same same wing. I'm trying to think of what we had a test wing. Uh, it was quite high aspect. It was that one I was talking about before. It was 13.4 aspect ratio. We built that in a bunch of different uh, constructions. We did one in solid carbon. Uh, we did one in normal carbon. And we did one in high modulus carbon. And we rode all three wings. And at that aspect ratio, the the normal carbon wing it was just a little bit too soft and what it felt like was uh, when you're going along, if you went over, a, um, you could feel every bump in the water. It was very sensitive. So, um, you know, relatively flat water day. But when you're going through the chop, you could feel the wing, you know, bending like this. Um, and if you went through someone's wake, you know, just about threw you off. You could really feel everything because it was just moving. Um, the solid carbon one was, was quite a bit stiffer. Um, quite a nice flex characteristic to it, even though it was solid. Um, and then the one that was out of high modulus, that was the stiffest of the lot. And that one felt like you could drive it and rely on it. And it felt really good. But I, I'm, I'm kind of with you. I think that as we get into these more high aspect wings, you know, being able to twist off on the, the tip, like a um, be active, like a, a, a windsurf sail might be beneficial. There's lots to learn. This You asked before, you know, are we getting to the point where we're not learning? Anything? No, every day we're trying yeah. something new. And so, it's, you know, it's fantastic to actually discover what's next and, you know. Yeah. Actually, I was just thinking about like earlier you mentioned helicopter blades. So I guess in a, on a helicopter blade, the angle of attack on the inside or the, the closest to the helicopter is really steep and thicker profile. And then as, as you go towards the tip, it kind of flattens out and has a thinner profile, right? So, but that part of that is just because the, the outside travels faster than the inside, right? Way because fast. Of the, Way yeah, fast. Much yeah. faster. So, and on a, on a foil, that's not really the case, right? But is it, or... Is there like a reason why it works works that way that you want to have a flatter, you know, have a steeper angle of attack in the middle and less at the end? Or, I mean, what's the reasoning for that? Well, that relates back to the twist that are, or the washout and the wingtips that we, we have in there before. And we've experimented with that quite a bit too. And, yeah. um, you know, we had some, some early wings where that, that twist in the wingtip, we went right up to eight degrees of twist in it. You know, it was oh, really, wow. really twisted. And we've had some, you know, all the way down to zero and everywhere in between. And, you know, we've sort of settled on what we've set on for the AIT, and that works really, really nicely. But it was surprising, even one degree of difference. It, it made a complete difference to how the wing works. So tuning that in is a, is a big part of getting the wing right. And, you know, every time you do a different wing, you know, a, a more high aspect wing, a shorter wing, you know, the, the, the amount of twist that's required or is actually beneficial is different. The same rules don't apply for every wing. 
you know so it's that's interesting yeah i mean that's something that i'm sure that there's a lot of room for improvement there so well we've got um, into a lot yeah. lately is yeah. doing um uh computer analysis of the wings so we can design a wing and then we can run run an analysis on it, analysis on it and then put it on a graph and the graph will give you uh where it takes off and um, how much drag it has at every speed that it's going at. Um, so you get like a, you know, a graph, a takeoff point, and then as soon as it's taken off, the, the, the drag will drop down and you get to a certain speed and then the drag will come back up again. But if you put one wing, you know, we can compare. So you've got the, if we had three wings, the same span, you know, the BSC uh, versus the HPS versus the AIT, we can plot the three graphs on top of each other and, um, the BSC is a very even hammock shaped graph, you know, the, the, it, it takes off and then the drag sort of drops down and then it sort of comes back up again. Um, the ART or even some of the prototypes we've had that are even more extreme, they, they take off and then the drag just drops almost vertically and it stays very level for a very low, long time and then it starts coming back up again. But um, I guess what I'm getting at is so we at least can, you we have a wider uh, sweet spot than for the, that, where they're comfortable. The, 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 that, that, that sudden they're comfortable drop in the, yeah. in the flat line at the bottom there, what that is is glide. That's your right. magic glide time where it just keeps running without yeah. wanting to slow down. Yeah. Um, Interesting. And, but basically we can, we used to, when we built a wing, we would, um, because the wings, they're relatively high aspect now, and we talked about G10 before. G10 is kind of of limited use to actually prototype a front wing because it's just not the same flex. So it's not going to give you the same results. So you can't really test in G10. So to build a wing, you really need to build a, a mold. So it's a tooling steel mold, and you have to, to press a wing in there. The construction of that wing, you know, what you lay it up is and how you build it and everything, that, that changes as well. So you've got to do a bunch of wings in that to, to get that. And then we then we test that and work out where we're going with it from there. Um, and, and every time you build a steel mold, it's a huge investment, right? So it, there's uh, a cost, but more importantly for me, there's a delay. You know, it takes two or three weeks to build that mold, yeah. and then it takes a week or two to build a prototype, and a week or two with COVID, at least a week or two to actually get the thing shipped to you. So there's perhaps six weeks lag from actually sending a finished idea off to actually getting it, so we can test it. And then, you know, maybe you don't have wind or anything suitable to test it for a week or so. So it's frustratingly slow and you can only step forward when you've learned what you can learn. But doing the analysis stuff, we can do a new wing and run the analytics on it and, um, you know, get a result and, and, and go through and say, oh, yeah, that's what it's going to do. When we first did it, we actually retrospectively did the analysis on all of the wings that we'd already built. When I looked at it, I kind of thought, well, what's the point of that? It's not really telling me anything. I knew all of that. And then I sort of thought, well, that's actually the point of it. You know, it, it confirms what we felt in our testing with those wings as proved in the, in, in the analysis. So then we could start actually building new wings. And every half an hour, we can build a new wing. We can run the analytic, analytics on it, get the graphs on it, and see whether it's a gain or not. We don't have to wait six weeks. We can do it again and again and again. It's, it's almost, right. as, almost more exciting. You don't need to get wet or wait for it. <laughs> right, right. So that's been a huge leap forward to um, working out what to do next. Another question from a customer here is, um, what are your general thoughts on mixing and matching foils between brands, in essence, using adapters such as Alchemy, Cedrus, No Limits? What are your feelings on that as a brand or as a manufacturer? Okay, so I'll answer that by going back to, to, to this new mask that I was telling you about before. And before we were talking about the, the base of the mask through here, it's really important the fibers run all the way through through there because this is really, really important for stiffness. Right. The other part that's really important is the join here. And the fibers from this, there's um, how many layers it's got a minute? 56 layers of carbon through there. And they run all the way to the bottom of here. So you're not relying on the screws at all. The screws hold the mast on there but you're actually relying on 56 layers of carbon. Anything that you've got with an, a mask from another company, when you're just bolting an adapter on there, most of the time you're relying on two M8 bolts. That is not suitable 
to attach your, your foil to it. You know, some, some of the early foiling companies, they, they did that. They actually had the mask coming down. They had their fuselage, and it was just a couple of bolts. Yeah, I remember the old slingshot ones. They were just sitting flat. And the mask was sitting flat it, on the fuselage. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, the, and we'll just bend. The screws would just bend over. There right. is too much stress for, for M8 screws. So um, I guess the point of, of that is that, you know, it's all very well to build a stiff mast, but if you can't attach it as strong as that to anything else, then it's not going to work. It's just not going to work. Okay. Um, next question. What is the best jumping wing combo? So, like, which, which wing do you recommend for jumping? Probably the 899 that you've got because it's fast um, and it gets a really clean takeoff. And yeah, it gets a nice pop. Yeah. yeah. One thing I noticed too with the shorter fuselage and I, I guess the smaller tail wing too, and maybe because the front wing is closer to the mast, like all those things combine to a much more twitchy feel or like much more sensitive, um, it's easier probably to turn, but also easier to like, but it's also more sensitive. Like if you, if you want to adjust it, you have to be much more um, careful. Like, you know, it's easy to over adjust. Like, you know, if you come too low and you try to push up all of a sudden you're breaching, right? You know, it's like very much more, it reacts much quicker than, uh, than my other setup was. But I guess for jumping, it's good because you want that, you want that thing to go up straight up. Right. So, yeah. You, you can tune that out quite easily just by putting a slightly bigger rear on there. Um, your front wing is the one that you're riding. Um, and then your your fuselage is the mounting point for your for your rear wing, and your rear wing is your your stabilizer. Mm -hmm. um, the size of that stabilizer and the length of the fuselage is to do with the feel that you want. If you have a longer fuselage, it's got, it's got to get a longer lever arm, and the, the rear wing becomes more effective. Um, and a bigger rear wing also becomes more effective. So if you're finding it too twitchy. Uh, just a slightly bigger wing. So if you're on the 325, just go for the 350 or the 375. Okay. You might only ride that for a couple of three weeks and then kind of go, oh, I kind of yeah. missed the 325. I, that's what I, I've only <laughs> tried it twice. So I think it's was part of, like in my second session, I was already much more comfortable on it. So it's just kind of what I'm, I'm used to, you know, so I have to just adjust we've, to that, I think. We've kind of had a weird thing too. And that is that for a lot of our team riders we test with, they were like 95 kg right through to 65 kg. And they were all, every single one of them, they were using the 325 progressive as the rear wing of choice. And, you know, I was generally riding the 375 and that felt pretty good to me. And I was kind of balanced on that. Um, and so we built a 300 progressive thinking that, you know, maybe a couple of them are light enough, freaky enough to actually hop on that and enjoy it. And they all hopped on it and said, yep, Miles better than the 325. We don't want to use the 325 anymore. And they're all riding that smallest 300. Um, and it just seemed crazy to me. Like the 300 is a tiny little wing. Um, so I've started using it a bit myself just to see. And it is twitchy, but you ride it for a day and you kind of get used to it. And that smaller rear, it does allow you to ride your front wing more freely. Like it turns better, um, quicker, it's more responsive. Um, it actually removes a lot of drag. I was blown away how how changing to a smaller rear wing, how much difference it made to the speed. Um, there's a guy here that GPS is everything he does, and he was riding a 400 progressive, uh, and he swapped out for um, one of the 380 speed wings, and he did two two kilometers an hour faster straight away, and his oh. average speed was up by three. And I, I couldn't believe that, you know, that a, changing a rear wing could make that much difference to, to your speed. You know, I would have thought you'd have to do an awful lot to your front wing to, to gain that many kilometers an hour speed. So the, the rear wing does add a lot of drag. Yeah, and it plays a really important role. I've noticed that too. Um, so another question, will you develop any more foils for the red fuselage? Um, yep, we've got one here. So the, the difference between the red fuselage and the, the, the black fuselage, the red fuselage was developed when, when the, the foils were really, really thick. Um, and, it, you know, it's quite a thick front end on it. Um, it and it, it really suits wings that are over 180 millimetres cord. Um, but then as wings have evolved and got narrower and narrower and narrower, um, the black fuselage is, is, you know, the one of choice for the smaller wings. Um, there'll come a time if we carry on going smaller and smaller when that's going to be a bit of a, 
um, work of art to make it fit on there. But here's a new wing, um, and I think this is coming out by the time you. When's the video coming out? <laughs> <laughs> Probably this Saturday, like in, in a few days. Um, what is that? The the eighteenth or nineteenth for you, I guess. Yep. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure now i'm not sure the exact date this is a this is a new um uh, it's a pump and glide wing and it's it's bigger uh it's the 1310 so it's a it's a bigger span than anything we've ever done before um but it's um it's also quite a bit of area like it doesn't really compare to the 1300 um or the 1150 or anything really it, it's very very good for pump this is the one that um, Hugo Rigglesworth pumped uh, over 17 minutes on flat water. Just wow. pumping. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so the answer is yes. You are still coming out with more wings for the red fuselage, um, but basically yep. they're made for the the uh, cords. wider cords. cords and thicker yep. thicker foils, yep. right? Yeah. yeah. Makes yep. sense. You've got you've got a different bolt pattern, obviously, on there, and and that makes a big a big difference to to what wing. You know, if you're going for bigger wings. You kind of need that. This this bigger wing here that I've just shown you too. The other thing I should mention with that is why that took so long to come out with, is that we needed the stiffer high modulus mast. You, it just doesn't really feel good on an aluminium mast. It's too wobbly. So it's a step by step thing. Having this new stiffer mast has allowed us to go for even bigger span wings and and even you know there's a whole lot more control in that that allows us to carry on developing mm -hmm. which is why i think that that new mast is so exciting yeah i definitely want to try one of those i'll probably post a video on that once i get to try it and uh, compare it to my aluminum mast um another question here what are the speed limiting factors um basically when you're winging um is it the hand wing drag or foil drag or like I guess a lot of people are getting into racing and wanting to go faster. That so, what what are the limiting speed limiting factors? Um, it's drag, um, and that can come in various forms. Um, for for racing, it depends on the racing you want to do. A lot of racing is windward lured, so you're racing upwind and then going back downwind again. And to get to windward, you, you actually need span and, and quite narrow cords. So some of our quite high aspect wings work very well for that. Um, some of those new ones that I've been playing with, um, I've got my favorite wings that I've been using. I'm finding those are starting to be a little bit too deep a draft. Um, and, you know, as you're going up wind, you're starting to see them start to, to back wind and luff and, you know, the, the wings are going to need to evolve. And with that in mind, um, when we were building wind surface um, a million years ago, we, you know, there was rig development, there was board development, and there was fin development and three separate developments. And when, you know, you sort of got stuck and that's as far as you could go. But then when a rig developed to go faster, suddenly you could change the board and then you could change the fin and then you could change the rig. And, you know, all of these parts need to work together to go faster. And, you know, yeah. similar for winging, like as we evolve faster foils, there'll be faster hand wings and, you know, that'll all allow us access to more speed. Okay. So I have a question for you. Like there's a lot of, um, it seems like a lot of talk going on right now about what's better for for wing foiling. Is it like in the, the tail of the board? Should it, is it better to have a flat uh, tail that kind of planes earlier? Or do you want that little kick in the tail to help you kind of um, avoid touching the water and so on? Like what what's your take and what what are your board? What do you use on your boards mostly? Um, I think you've got one of my boards. The, 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 we used to have a kick in the tail, and that was more right. for sup foiling and you know bigger cord wings. And as you paddled to take off, those those wings needed angle of attack, so you needed to roll back yes. to get the wing to pop out. And yeah. the, the chisel on the tail allowed you to do that and popped up cleanly. With the modern wings we've got now, they're they're very high aspect and very fast. And you mentioned before that if you try and take off too slow, they just go up and down and crash and whatever. They don't yeah. work. But you need to be able to have a bit more speed. So just just simple flat. And um, the the back of our board, it's very uncomplicated looking. You know, there's no channels or anything like that. And you know, you've just got to you know generate 
some speed to get going. I, I don't believe in all of the cutout mess in there because I, I, you know, you're not actually, you're not really getting to planning speeds. Um, you've just got to generate a bit more speed to pop up on the wing. So right. you just it's normal... more about eliminating drag at lower speeds, right? Try, you're not really trying to reduce drag at planning speed so much, right? Okay, just so yeah, just very simple flat simple. tail. Yeah, flat. Yeah. And, it, and it's relatively wide. It's got quite a big span back here. So it's, it's got a reasonable area here for you to pump off. Um, and what about has... the front of the board? Do you, do you have a concave or is it more convex? Um, what, what's concave. your theory on that? No concaves. Co concaves, they, they give you um, something to catch on and, they, and they, they give you a bit of steering. So in a, they were actually quite useful in a, subfoiling situation when you're paddling for a wave it actually gives you some direction through here but you, you don't need that with winging um, and the board is, is just flat across there with a bevel on the rail so it doesn't catch and when it comes down and touches it just bounces straight back up again whereas if you have a concave it sort of catches and grabs and then you bring it yeah. back up again. Yeah. sometimes it has a little bit of breaking it, it like it feels like it sucks gets stuck on the water the concave i i found on my board yeah I just do it. I just do it flat and it works fine. Okay. Well, thanks so much for your time. Uh, just to wrap it up, I guess, do you have any um, any uh, wisdom that you can share on just living a good life or what is things you do to um, stay, uh, stay healthy, happy mentally and physically or any kind of... Um, not really. I mean, during the whole COVID... New Zealand had a horrendous lockdown compared to the rest of the world. And there was times when we weren't allowed to go on the water, which made no sense to me. You know, um, I'm a water person and being able to go out in the water fishing and see the dolphins and whales and, and sharks and stuff that are out there or to go out foiling and have fun, you know, that that makes me happy. And, you know, you've got to be able to do that, I think. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's that's always a, a good way to um kind of turn off from your regular life and get on the yep. water and, and enjoy the enjoy nature right so yeah very good all right anything else you want to share with the Wingfo community out there um lots more to come um and can't wait to get into it <laughs> yeah excellent yeah. Okay, well, yeah, I keep putting out, I mean, it's it's really impressive how many foils you've um, designed and it sounds like you're, you're not nearly done yet. So <laughs> keep no, carry on with that. Some, some people sort of say it's too complicated or something, but like really, you know, we've got the SES package for full on beginners and it's just your weight, eight, over 80 kg, under 80 kg. And then as you get more into it, you know, it kind of veers off in all sorts of different directions. It's not right. like you need to have every single foil that we build. Um, it's more catering for all of those various directions you might want to go in. And that's just, you know, we like we like to explore and find what we can get in the, in the extremes of all of that. So the range is quite big, but it's relatively simple as well. Excellent. Once you understand it. Yeah. Okay, Adrian, I really appreciate your time. And uh, yep. we'll, I'll probably check back with you again in, in, in six months or a year, and then we'll, we'll catch up on what's new. Yep. Looking forward yeah. to having you go on your wing sometime too. All right. Yeah. When I'm back, uh, hopefully I'll be back in New Zealand sometime. And then, yeah, then we can talk about the wing too. I guess yep. Dan sent you one of our wings, but you haven't had a chance to try it yet. No. Looking forward to having you go. Um, sounds great. All, All right. right, Adrian. Thank you. Aloha. Cheers, Robert. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. All right. You're still here. Thank you so much for sticking around to the very end. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. The next interview is going to be with Clifford from Unifoil. So another really great foil designer. I'm going to get into more detail on foil design, ask all the questions about what's new, what's coming, and uh, so much exciting stuff going on in the world of foiling. So many improvements and uh, better and better performance that we can get from the foils. So it's a really exciting time to be a foiler. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you to all our customers at New Planet Surf. You make it possible for us to put together this show. And if you're not already a customer, please consider us next time when you're buying foil equipment, newplanetsurf.com, or visit our shop in Honolulu or in Haleiwa on Oahu. 
So thanks again for watching. Please remember to give it a thumbs up. Make sure to subscribe to the Blue Planet Surf YouTube channel. And we'll see you on the water. Aloha. Thank you.